welcome everybody. You're here for another episode of uh, Ask the Patent Professor, except today you get an opportunity to ask the inventor. And it's my pleasure to introduce Babak uh, Farutanpour. He's an amazing inventor. He's got over a hundred patents. Uh, he's been on NBC's Today Show, uh, Fox Morning News, and uh, his life was not complete until he's on the Patent Professor television. <laughs> so, so now he's here. It's a, a huge, huge privilege, uh, Babek, to have you here. Oh, thank you. Uh, and uh, we're going to go for probably about 20 minutes, and I have some questions. And uh, I know uh, a lot of our viewers are, are interested in your background and how you got to where you are. Uh, and then we'll open up the floor for, uh, for questions. We have several questions that have been submitted already, so I do have those. Um, but why don't you start with uh, wherever you'd like. Start with a little bit about your background. How does one... Uh, go from our, our backgrounds are very similar from in, in that we were in a corporate environment. I was at a huge, you know, multinational law firm until I started my own practice and you were at Qualcomm. So uh, take it away. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I wish, you know, that I could tell you that, you know, at a young age, I was, you know, my dad and I would go to the junkyard and we we bring home, you know, uh, motors or, or, you know, things and take them apart and learn how they work and put them back together or that I, you know, that I was inventing when I was a young kid. And really, you know, that's not the case. You know, I didn't really start, you know, I think as a young kid, maybe I was more a little bit into business. So I had a car wash, I would paint fences, I would, um, I did magic shows. So I think for me, my innate tendencies are more as an entrepreneur and so, and then, you know, once college started and, you know, did, you know, say that UCSD and then eventually UCLA and then started working for 10 years in Hollywood doing special effects for movies, a lot of that kind of subsided. So I was neither inventing nor was I um, following my entrepreneurial passions because the companies that I worked at, you know, I was just having so much fun. So having worked on, you know, I'm kind of dating myself, but there was a, uh, in, 1995 after college I joined Warner Brothers where we worked on a movie called Space Jam with Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny and so that really I got bit by the computer graphics 2D 3D bug and so I spent five to eight years doing you know special effects in movies and to your point it wasn't really until I went to Qualcomm where I was exposed to you know doing research in the lab and the company wanting to protect their IP and so it wasn't until literally like 15 years ago uh, that um, you know, I realized that I have this creative side, this creative problem solving side where I kind of look at things maybe a little bit different than others. And so one example would be, you know, I worked in the multimedia department. Again, Qualcomm is a company that makes chips for cell phones. It's, uh, it's probably in the phone that you have today. And I worked in the camera department. So making sure that the cameras can take better pictures. That's yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're in the iPhone. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, you know, I was in the camera department and you know, we, I would work with these PhDs that would spend all this time um, creating an algorithm whereby when you want to take a picture, you know, with your phone, it has to figure out what light source it's under. And in order to do that, it has to look at pixels that are near gray in the image and figure out, are they a little bluish or yellowish gray to kind of figure out, are you under incandescent, fluorescent or the sun? And after a while of, you know, working with the PhDs on this, I'm like, guys, I'm help me understand something here. We're not just working on a camera. We're working on a phone, which has all these extra sensors. It has a microphone. It has a speaker. It has GPS. It has a clock. So at 2 a.m., obviously the sun has set if the GPS tells you, whatever, you're in San Diego or, or somewhere else. And so we know the sun, it can't be D65, which is for the sun. It has to be a man-made light. So you can kind of improve uh, the process by uh, assuming that it can't be all light sources, it can only be limited light sources, or the fact that we can listen for the lights. And so that's really when my inventive spirit was really kind of kicked off when I realized that you can solve these complex technical problems that others have been doing for years in creative ways. And when I got my first patent uh, on a camera that can take better pictures using not the the sensor itself, the CMOS or CCD sensor, but the microphone, the speaker, the clock, the GPS, that's when I was, and then I worked with patent attorneys to protect that and do the drawings and the claim set that I kind of got bitten by the bug. That I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. I just, I may have been 
myself and my team, the first people in the world that have ever created a camera that takes a better picture using these other sensors. And that was, that was thrilling. And honestly, after that first one, uh, while well, it was a lot of work and 11 years of research, that's, it, it led to two and five and 10 and 15 and 20. And I just got bit by the bug. I love working with patent agents such as yourself uh, to, because they really become part of the team, right? Where you just don't hand over your research. They oftentimes, especially the ones at Qualcomm will sometimes help you improve it. They ask probing questions. Did you think about this? Did you think about it coming from that angle? Because they wanted, what's the term they used? Um, I think it was a walled garden. They wanted to build right. a walled garden of IP around this one breakthrough. So working with the agents, doing the research in a team environment is really what made the 100 patents seem like it just, it made it fly by. So all that to say, it's not something that I started out doing. It's something that uh, was really inspired during my research at Qualcomm. And you take that with my entrepreneurial spirit and then you kind of have, um, you know, uh, the, the path I've been going forward the last uh, five, six years. Well, the, I mean, what caught my attention is, uh, of course, you're, uh, I mean, I've, I've done a TED Talk on the power of simple ideas and simple everyday innovations that uh, some people do not even think warrant a patent because there's this myth out there that you've got to have like a flux capacitor. If you remember back to the future, yeah, right. before you go and see a patent attorney and although some of your ideas, they seem, you know, this, the, the, the cell phone, uh, better pictures might seem very complicated. Uh, but I'd love if you have any of your prototypes, if you talk about some of the toy and game type ideas that uh, in hindsight, that's what examiner patent examiners are not allowed to reject a patent on something called hindsight reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a technical fancy term. And what it basically means is that if today it looks like uh, uh, the idea is not new or novel, that doesn't mean that it wasn't new or novel at the time the inventor came up with it. Because once it's explained, it seems yeah. like, like going back to the cell phone. Yeah. You would think today, of course, cell phones take pictures. Like I, you couldn't buy, I couldn't get my kids, and I don't know the ages of yours, but if they're old enough for a cell phone, you could not get them to use a cell phone that didn't have take pictures. But at one time, this was extremely novel. It was unique, the concept that some device that's for make for communicating or, you know, in audio will also take and share pictures. Yeah. So, uh, so tell us about that. And uh, if you want to share your prototypes that were... Sure, yeah. Yeah, I just want to touch upon what you said. It's like right now we can talk about <laughs> a camera that takes better pictures using the microphone because it listens for the lights. And maybe now it's obvious that it's an integrated system. So obviously, you know, there's synergy when, when all the different parts work together. But 15 years ago, you know, it was like super duper cool that, whoa, these guys built a camera that's better than the one next to it because it uses the other sensor. So, right. And then as far as, you know, other things that, uh, you know, maybe kind of maybe make sense now or, or stuff that I've kind of worked on is, you know, that to me, again, this is just my mindset, uh, you know, kind of seem, you know, kind of, uh, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't say obvious, but uh, something that I think the market needs is, you know, one of my latest inventions, and this one, uh, I've also filed a patent on, and surprisingly, it got approved in like two and a half years. I figured, you know, it would take longer, but uh, the response came back quickly. And what I call, this is what I call, if you can kind of see it, it takes a while for the lighting to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this is basically, I call it the Baker Buddy. Um, and it's basically something that has, and the patent covers having a device that has a crescent shaped uh, uh, um, insert that you can then place over a mixing bowl. And so this allows um, people to bake inside their home by having everything they need in one area. And so first thing you'll notice that it has a trash can back here. So when you put this over your mixing bowl and you crack an egg, just drop it right here. It has two areas here where you can hold your mixing spoon. It has a recipe card holder. Uh, over here, it has um, an egg cracker. And the cool thing is when you crack the egg, it, it spills right into the bowl, right? And that's oh, really wow. where this thing started. The whole purpose of this was my wife simply asking, Babak, you know, I want to crack an egg over the bowl without having any of it drip outside the bowl or on the countertop. And so I'm like, well, I could, for, I could make something you hang on a bowl that has the egg cracker. 
but then I added everything else. And I think what the really cool part too is I have these measuring cups you can see from half a teaspoon, full teaspoon, also for tablespoon, and then a cup here. And so when you wanna measure something like vanilla extract or a cup of flour, you pour it in here and then it simply tilts into the bowl, right? So with- Oh, with oh wow, that tilt. <clears throat> I, I just see a comment, they, uh, Michelle loves the tilt and loves the idea. I didn't, that, so you have, it's hinged then, right? Is it a plastic hinge? Exactly, so there's a hinge at the bottom that allows you, that allows this part to tilt. Mm -hmm. The other part that's novel, which we have a claim on, which I think is super exciting is uh, the fact that, as you can see, there's these holes that I inserted. And again, this stuff is all obvious now, but I could show you the 52 prototypes that it took to get to this place. I start with cardboard and clay. But as you can see, there's these uh, holes here that allow it, so if you over pour, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if you over pour the cup or your, uh, again, vanilla extract, it goes through the hole into the second reservoir. Uh, again, it's kind of- Oh, wow. Yeah. The no, second I can reservoir that's- and so you can, because, you know, with children, I have 14-year-old twins, and, you know, when she's kind of pouring the flour, she may pour too much, and you just simply wipe it away, it goes into the hole. So, you know, it's amazing if I was to show you, and I have a video that I could uh, share, and actually, it's on a website called uh, thebakerbuddy.com, uh, where I'm collecting emails prior to a Kickstarter campaign. On that website, you'll see the video of how, with this one thing, it's just so much easier than... Um, having all the dirty spoons and eggshells and, and trash and then um, knives and mix, it's, it just yeah. simplifies it. So, I mean, I don't know if you've heard, but during this pandemic, there's been this huge, huge surge of, uh, for, first of all, gardening and baking. So those two things with everyone at home and, and certainly, I don't know about your household, but because if they use this prototype, it's probably not as messy, but oh my God, the kitchen cleanup after Exactly. <laughs> After and that's the thing. I love baking with my daughter, uh, but it's the cleanup, as you said, <laughs> is the part that I that I'm done. And what's so cool, and you'll see it on our video, is that when we're done mixing and pouring and, and baking it, I just simply take this to the kitchen sink and the countertop is clean. I mean, it's really it's it's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, that, that's that's, uh, you know, one of the inventions. I also have other ones that I could show you as well. Uh, real quick, I can show you. This one, this one, uh, we also filed the patent. Uh, oh, so and, real quick before you get to that, sure, what was the sure. website again for that first one? And oh, then, so if, actually, I'll just give you one website because from that one website, uh, our viewers can go, your viewers can go to all the different products. Perfect, so, perfect, yeah. Uh, the website is Brilliant Company, okay. www.brilliantcompany.com. Not brilliant as in me and my team are brilliant, brilliant as in we take everyday objects and we polish them, we shine them, and we make them better. Okay, um, great. Jenny, and we have a, a panelist who's helping out here. If you can type that into our chat box, and that way uh, the viewers would get that URL. Perfect. So let's, I, now, you, now we've got this sneak peek at the second one. I'm anxious to see it. Uh, oh, I have sure. no idea what it was. Like, it was blue is all I can remember. Yeah, so this is, so this is another one that I made. Uh, this one was for uh, uh, my son and my daughter as well. There's a pink one that I could bring over. But, uh, you know, essentially the problem... So the Baker Buddy solves the problem of the messy cleanups. Uh, the Tooth Diary uh, solves the problem of the fact that, you know, uh, when the Tooth Fairy comes and takes the child's teeth, uh, you know, they can often misplace it. Um, sometimes it's in a, you know, the, you know, they can misplace it. I don't want to go into in case there's children <laughs> watching. And so essentially what the Tooth Diary is, is it's a doll for the child that they can remove. It's a toy so it's in their room looks beautiful they can play with it and they take the cap off and inside the cap is everything a child needs in order to uh, manage her time with the uh, with the uh, with the tooth diary and so if you were to remove a tube so let me grab one here oh hold on a second uh, I think it's one second here we go so the tubes come out and there's 20, tu 20 tubes, one for each tooth, obviously, and they open up and inside the tube, you can place the child's tooth or the child places the tooth in the top compartment. And then in the doll, there's also 20 notes where they can write a little note for the tooth fairy asking for what they want. There's also an included pencil and they close the tube, which has the tooth at the top. They roll up the note using the pencil and they stick it to the bottom of the tube. And this is what they put under their pillow. 
when all 20 teeth have been collected by the tooth fairy, then the child uses the 21st note to ask for their teeth back. And when they wake up, they have all the 20 tubes under their pillow. They put it back in the doll and now they can give it to their mom or dad as a tooth fairy keepsake. So it's a way for uh, the tooth fairy to kind of organize her loot. Uh, we think it's a perfect like baby shower gift, the perfect present for a, 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 someone with a newborn, something you find at baby, uh, you know, um, um, baby depot or babies R us. Okay, wow, wow, that's that's fascinating. I, I saw a couple questions from uh, Michelle had a question: Is there a, a two-part process to applying for a patent? And for our viewers, like every. Uh, next week, next Friday at noon, we're going to have Ask the Patent Professor. So your, your, your heavy patenting questions, I would ask to hold for that. But certainly as an inventor with over 100 patents, I think <laughs> Babak knows more than a thing or two about the patent process. Uh, so by two part, they're pr most likely it's the provisional and the non-provisional. So talk to us about that. Tell us about uh, what type you have filed for these. Uh, and let's go from there. Yeah, so exactly. It sounds like your user, uh, your your viewer is right on the mark. It is, at least for me, not, and it doesn't have to be for every inventor, a two-part process. Uh, so when I have the germ of an idea, um, I will start prototyping it. It goes through several iterations of prototyping. And when it gets to a point where I feel, um, you know, and I've shown it to friends and family, so we've done user studies, if you will. And when it's at a point where I'm starting to look like I'm really going to bring this to market, either through licensing or through bringing it to market myself, that's when I'll file the provisional. Um, and I don't necessarily recommend all inventors do this, but again, since I've been through the process over a hundred times uh, and I'm familiar with, um, you know, how to roughly lay out a patent, um, then I'll just, I'll oftentimes maybe file those myself just because again, I have the experience of going through it. Um, and then uh, once that year is up, at that point, I have a much better idea, obviously, of whether this is something that has legs and um, I'm going to continue to try to find a licensee or I'm going to bring to market. And at that point, I'll work with a professional patent attorney because, as your viewers may know, the provisional doesn't have the claims, which is the most critical part. And right. when, you need to, when you file the full-blown utility and or design patent, uh, then you kind of need to flush it all out. So yeah, I'll do a provisional and then eventually a utility. Oftentimes I'll do a design with the utility because I've heard that when you sell products on Amazon and don't quote me, oftentimes they're too busy to dig very, very deep into the utility. They'll do it if things escalate, but the design patent they will look at. And so if you also have a design patent on top of your utility, it's very easy for them to open it up, look at the diagram, look at the pictures, and see that an infringer is selling something that's like identical to yours without even needing to dig deep into the claim set. So I'll oftentimes do utility and uh, design. So it's actually kind of a three-step process. Yeah, no, that's that's good advice. And uh, Jenny, as our as our pan panelist here uh, in doing the the work in the background, uh, I believe the last week of May. Uh, we had uh, asked the patent professor, and the focus was the different types of patents, utility, design, and provisional, non-provisional. So uh, all of this is posted in the Inventor's Mastermind on Facebook. So Jenny, if you can put a uh, URL to the Inventor's Mastermind. Um, I do, how's the, did you happen to have the, the Aria ball? Oh yeah. As well, that is like unbelievable. I, I'd love, I, no, this oh, interview sure. would not be complete without seeing that. <laughs> Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, so the Aria ball is one, again, the one that I made for the kids, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, which was basically we're at the park and I was throwing the football with my son and he's like, Dad, I also want to play soccer. And I said, that's, you know, I didn't bring the soccer ball. He's like, well, let's just kick the football. And I'm trying to explain to, I think he was seven at the time, that you can't kick a football, it's the wrong shape. He's like, well, I want to do it anyway. And I'm like, fine, we'll try it. You're going to see that it doesn't roll the way we want it to. And so we're kicking a football. He was upset. And I knew that on our way home, he's probably just gonna unfortunately go back on his uh, iPad at the time. And so I really decided, you know, and maybe part of it is being lazy where I don't wanna carry a bunch of equipment to the park, soccer ball, football, what have you. I wanna have one thing. So again, uh, this one was maybe, I don't know, 70 prototypes later, um, but I made this, uh, what I call the Aria ball. And I won't take it out of the packaging for the sake of time, but essentially, as you can see, um, it's a soccer ball that you twist open inside the soccer inside the soccer ball is a football 
and we kind of cheated. We made the girth of the football kind of wide so even parents can throw it. Um, and then on top of that, there's a Frisbee in there as well that's sandwiched in there. I should say flying disc because Frisbee's trademark, so we want to respect uh, the Whammo <laughs> company. That's right. Uh, and then uh, I, I could go get the bat, but I won't, but it's, it's on the website. Uh, and so yeah. I also designed a bat that comes with it because the bat, um, the tip opens up into uh, um, a golf putter. Because what I didn't mention is inside the football, there's also another ball, which we call a base golf, which is uh, a ball that has the stitching of a baseball, but the dimples of a golf ball. And so you have soccer, football, flying disc, inside the football is a base golf ball. And then with the bat, you can play baseball and golf. And so you can have uh, five different games. And what's really kind of cool was, uh, I submitted for a TV show called The Toy Box some five years ago that was aired on NBC. And, you know, out of, you know, thousands of applicants, they willed it down to 35. They flew us out to New York. It was two days of taping. I was fortunate to become a finalist on the top four. Um, and then, you know, I got booted. The, the, uh, a better toy. A, a, I wouldn't say better toy, a very cool toy one. In fact, let me give a shout out to. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, the toy that won. Because us inventors, we stick together. The toy that won is Art Splash. So Art Splash is really cool. It's uh, uh, my friend's invention. In fact, I think we're on the box here in, in a small little part. But anyways, uh, yeah, so Ryan Stewart invented this where you can basically, it's coloring with uh, colored water. So anyways, uh, shout out to Ryan, Art Splash beat Aria Ball, but I'll get him next time. Yeah, a lot of inventors. There's there's a lot of uh, uh, camaraderie amongst inventors. So I mean, it's yeah. a great you know good sportsmanship on your part to have lost out to this uh, this other yeah. one and still uh, like it. We have on our uh, inventors mastermind, I, I think fifteen hundred inventors on our Facebook group, and they're constantly helping one another, providing advice, providing yeah. hints. Um, we're we're a special breed, John. You know, like. You know, to be able to be creative enough to to seek a problem of, you know, a child kicking a football or messy countertops. And, you know, you got to give inventors major props. They're almost like comedians where they pick up on these on these signals that others don't see. But then when they find that and they they expand on it and they share it with people, everyone's like, oh, I have that problem, too. Or that is funny to me as well. But inventors take it one step further with with the grind that is licensing and and or manufacturing. So you got it's that's why we stick together and we support each other so much is you got to have both skills and both of them are are challenging. It's not ne necessarily something you can go to school and, and four year college, six year college and get an education. The creativity and the grit that it takes are uh, it, it's not something that everyone has, and it's something that, while it can be taught, it comes more natural to those who, um, you know, who are, I don't know, maybe you can say, I don't know. Yeah, who, who so, I mean, it's know. funny you mentioned uh, that sometimes, like, this is the post-it note. I mean, uh, so, sells over a billion dollars a year uh, in product, and it's basically paper with glue that doesn't damage uh, ink. So, I mean, you could right. on a sheet of paper, it doesn't tear up the contract. So simple idea, but what I wanted to point out, sometimes the brilliance of an inventor is not necessarily even the solution because you can go to, to could have gone to any college and asked an engineer to design this and they would have done it. The brilliance is figuring out that there's a demand and that there's people that are frustrated with using tape and a piece of paper to leave notes and that there's a need for this. And what I, I'm thinking about is you're not the first person to have been annoyed by cracking an egg on the side of a bowl and having some of the egg white stream down the bowl. It's, a, it's one of these minor, small irritations uh, that, but you, what separates you is that you, as an inventor, you did something about it and addressed that in your product. And I think that's what separates inventors, that they're, they're not willing to live with the status quo even the irritations that are minor. I mean, the, the sleeve on a coffee cup uh, is to stop your fingers from getting too hot, like, you know, is one of the, the benefits. It's not a huge, your fingers don't burn. I mean, your coffee hopefully isn't that hot 
and people might have other ways to deal with it. You can use two cups, but somebody uh, realized that, you know what, that is a big enough problem that I might not be the only one addressing that. And uh, his name is uh, uh, Paul Sorensen and his licensing revenues were over a million dollars a year for 20 wow. years. It's important. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, John, if I could, you know, you touch upon a point that I think is important. If, the, if it's one thing I'd like to leave your viewers with today is the fact that, you know, practice finding these problems. Whether you pursue them or not, that's like step B. You could find someone else to, you know, give half your company to or what have you to have them pursue it or, or other. But if, like you said, we've all seen these problems and, and in order to to become an inventor, become a better inventor, you need to practice. And so I would challenge everyone today, before you go to bed at night, find three things in your daily routine that you think could be improved. And it could be, as you said, something as simple as the Java jacket. It could be something as, oh, when I crack an egg, a little bit dribbled out. It could be something of, you know, you know, why can't the AC know my body temperature and change the AC based on, you know, my body temperature instead of a thermostat on a wall. So just practice those things and i guarantee you a it's a lot of fun because it's kind of a gamification and then b you will be surprised that you may be one of those who's really freaking good at it and if you're really good at it it could be great side income uh or maybe even primary income and i saw my friend Kayvon islami in, the, in your chat room said babak do you do this to because you love inventing or to save your marriage <laughs> it's a little bit of both <laughs> Kayvon, because uh it keeps me happy, healthy, and I'm a better husband, and it keeps me away from Pulak so she doesn't scream at, scream at me as much. So there's plenty of benefits from becoming an inventor beyond just, you know, maybe a, a payday or something. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's terrific. I know we're we're out of time, but there we're about, and, and any questions that are not addressed, uh, please go to the Inventors Mastermind for our viewers, and I'll go on, I'll try to address as many as I can. Um, hopefully we'll have Babak come back at some point uh, and we'll do this again. But uh, there are a few questions all relating to uh, raising funds for the ideas and fundraising. Sure. And I know you've done a Kickstarter campaign. So talk to us a little bit about that and then uh, we'll close out the interview. Yeah, uh, no, that's wonderful. It's a great question. So, you know, it's take, I've, boy, I've made a lot of mistakes, uh, you know, getting to where I am today. And I know I'll make many, many more one of them, this is, again, this is what's worked for, what has and hasn't worked for me. Uh, your mileage may vary, but for some of my earlier inventions, I would do what they call a seed round, right? Friends and family, if everyone could kick in two grand, then I have enough money to go do user testing or, or 3D print it or what have you. And, you know, the first couple inventions that I had failed, uh, and some of them weren't even inventions, they were businesses that I tried, things that you wouldn't protect with a patent. And, and to this day, you know, I feel bad that I lost the money of some friends and family. Now, I've since paid it back, but I guess what I'm trying to say is be very careful when you follow the traditional seed round, angel round, and then series ABC, because when you take money from friends and family, and if you lose the money, it's the guilt is uh, gut wrenching. So to answer your viewers question, I no longer go to my brother or my others to fund my inventions because uh, chances of success are slim. And so I, you know, will work extra jobs, extra hours, save, cut back, do whatever I need to do to pay for it myself to get it to a point where, as you said, I can then bring it on these amazing crowdfunding platforms, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, uh, whereby when I have, you know, a 3D printed prototype that maybe cost me, well, I mean, this cost a while because of the design, but let's say if under, you, you could, if you work efficiently, and you know, maybe you could make something like this for under, let's say 5,000. And so uh, when I get to a point where I have something I can take on Kickstarter, I will either take it on Kickstarter or, uh, or license it. Uh, there's a great company called Lifetime Brands where I'm going to take, you know, the Baker Buddy to. And right now we're in talks. They may want to pick up the license. They may not want to take it up. But uh, there's companies uh, that you can license your patents to uh, to get uh, royalties or you can sell it yourself with the funding coming from Kickstarter. But to answer your initial question, I personally, because I've gone down the path and I've been burned, I don't raise money from friends and, and, friends and family. Um, okay. I think that's good advice. Um, 
of course, when you have over 100 plus patents, pretty soon your friends and family might tire of, <laughs> of, of being asked to, uh, to invest. Um, but I think the other reason, of course, it's, it's a risk, right? And why, uh, especially, you know, when I became a patent attorney 20, 25 years ago, there was no such thing as, as Kickstarter, like crowdfunding just did not, hadn't evolved to the level it is now. Uh, I call this the golden age of inventing. The options Absolutely. available to inventors are, are, are limitless. So why not take advantage of them? Uh, and you, you can get, you know, a lot more mileage through Kickstarter. Uh, and you're basically taking pre-orders, so you're you're building a customer base as well. Yeah, and if I could, John, if I could give a shout out to, sure. uh, or I shouldn't say shout out, a plug to the Kickstarter that I'm working on that's coming up in the next couple months. It's for, you know, we talked about the Baker Buddy, which was kind of for my daughter, and the Tooth Diary, which is, uh, you know, you know, for my son and daughter, and Aria Ball, which was for my son. The one that I'm doing for myself, that I did for myself, just purely because it was a pain point for me is one that I call tilted. And if you study folks who hold their mobile phones, especially the larger models, you'll kind of see a lot of them balance it on their pinky, right? A lot of people kind of hold their phone this way. Those who choose yeah. to use it yeah. one handed, right? Yeah. A lot of people do two hands, but if you like to multitask, like, I don't know, eat or, uh, you know, change the channel on the TV and you use your own one handed, uh, you bounce it on your pinky. And what I found was after a while, my pinky was getting sore. I mean, I don't know, maybe I have dainty hands or what have you, but uh, it was starting to hurt. That's a lot of weight. You know, the iPhone 11 Pro Max is twice the weight of the iPhone uh, 5. It's 220, it's, I think it's 220 grams. So essentially I decided to make something that would support the pinky. Right. So if you kind of see here, this little thing will flick down Boom, right there. Oh, wow. Yeah. I can flick it up or I can flick it down, you know, with a single finger. And it's basically, you know, a pillow, if you will, for your pinky. So you just kind of rest your pinky there uh, and then you can, uh, you know, use your phone. You can reach all the, you know, all the buttons. And then when you're done, you just kind of flick it closed. What I like about it is that it's discreet where on the back of my phone case, uh, can't even see it. You, you can you can still support wireless charging. So some of the competitors out there, there's one pop plunge or something that, you know, you put it right back here. It doesn't allow uh, wireless charging on some wireless chargers. Plus, I like to have these fun, you know, custom cases. Uh, and when you, when you put those rings or the straps or the pop things on the back of your phone, you can't have the picture of, let's say, your family or loved ones. So uh, this is called Tilted because uh, you tilt your phone back for ultimate comfort. And I'm going to be doing a Kickstarter in the coming months. So I would really appreciate if folks kind of enjoyed this talk and they think Tilted is something that uh, would help them in their uh, mobile phone use to go to uh, thebrilliantcompany.com. Okay, good. So it's written about on the Brilliant Company on that website. Exactly. They can just go there. Yep. Okay. Uh, Babek, I, this it's been an, an ex incredible honor to have you here today, I'm sure. Uh, the viewers have, have a ton of questions. We'll hopefully have you back. And then, uh, back. Thanks so much, John. It's a lot, of, a lot of I, love the, I love the rapid fire questions. It's uh, <laughs> fast paced, exciting. And if people want to reach out to me, they can again go to the website and there's a contact form or they can so email that's on me. Brilliant at, Company as well. Yeah. Like, so Bobak, B A B A K, at brilliantcompany.com. I'd be happy to answer the questions. Uh, um, you know, if, if we didn't get a chance to get to all of them today. Okay. And of course, for anyone that, uh, that has patenting type questions, uh, Fridays that ask the patent professor, uh, usually it's Q and a. So next Friday, uh, uh, we'll be sending out a link and it'll be in the inventors mastermind as well. So thank you, Babek. It's been a, a pleasure and thank you guys for attending. Have a nice Thanks, week. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. Yep. Bye.